It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, when I first started thinking about the Centre for Cultural Relations, I went on Google, as you do, and I entered the terms cultural diplomacy. And the thing that came up, of course, was the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, um, as it does. Um, so it's a particular pleasure for me to be here today. I want to talk about two things. Um, one is I just want to say a little bit about the Centre for Cultural Relations in the University of Edinburgh. And then I want to present some research um, which the Centre for Cultural Relations is doing and still hasn't quite finished yet. So this is not even hot off the press. This is still just hot uh, work that we're doing for the British Council. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about transnational engagement and why we talk about transnational engagement rather than cultural diplomacy, if, if you wish. Um, I, ho I hope to not talk for terribly long so that we've got a chance uh, for questions, uh, because I'd like to hear you know, what you think, because uh, it's not just a question of me talking today. I have got rather a lot of slides. If I'm talking too quickly, um, or there's something which you would like to hear a little bit more about, could you please save it till the end, okay? Could you please try, because otherwise I will never get through my slide pack and we will be here until um, goodness knows when. So w let me just start. Um, the University of Edinburgh is just a little bit about the university. It's an old university. Um, we've been around for quite a long time. We said we've been engaging globally for 385 years, or whatever it is. Um, the university is deeply embedded in the city of Edinburgh. It's a civil society institution in its own right, uh, probably one of the most important in Scotland. Uh, and the university's mission is very simple, which is the creation, dissemination and curation of knowledge. So uh, we're a very research-focused university, but we also offer a lot of Courses. Uh, so we have more than 300 taught programs and 130 academic research units within the university. So we're quite a large and complex university. And these are just some images of the traditional side of the university graduation ceremonies and medical research is one of our main features. But we also try and think to the future. And I'm going to say a little bit about digital media tonight uh, in the context of the discussion on social media. So this is just, just for fun, really, a couple of slides. This is a thing called the Virtual University of Edinburgh, which is a project which is being run in our informatics department, uh, envisaging what the university of the future might look like. So there are no buildings like this. There are just people crouched over laptops uh, in cafes, engaging with each other on Second Life or whatever. So one of the fun, funny things about it is that when people start to imagine these campuses of the future, they look alarmingly like campuses of the past. It's just that they're on laptops rather than in cities. Um, anyway, the Centre for Cultural Relations is a new interdisciplinary international research and knowledge exchange hub in the, centre, in the University of Edinburgh. To date, we have only been engaged in research. We don't offer courses uh, or study, although that may change in due course. And we were deliberately set up to engage this field of cultural diplomacy or transnational engagement in a new way. Um, if you look around other universities in the world, mostly this study is um, situated in international relations departments, maybe political science. It can be in cultural studies. It can be in uh, units teaching intercultural skills, business schools. There are little elements of this subject taught in all sorts of places, and we thought, well, there's a reason for that. It's because there are a large number of academic disciplines that can potentially contribute. So we set ourselves up from the beginning in order to be interdisciplinary, and to facilitate working in collaboration with a wide range of partners. Now, this building with the blue plaque, that actually is the Centre for Cultural Relations. Um, and we have a, an aim, a simple goal, which is to promote effective transnational engagement. Uh, I'll say what I mean by that in just a moment, by understanding better its theory and practice in the 21st century. Now, the reason we ended up with transnational engagement is because cultural relations uh, and an academic field of inquiry are very hard to define. Different people mean different things by it. But there are a number of concepts which underpin research and study in this area across the world. The first is connectivity. And I'm going to be talking a lot about connectivity tonight. The original research which we've been doing with the British Council is into the UK's digital connectivity. Okay. How connected is the UK to the rest of the world through digital media? So do you have a connection? Do we have a network? How does it manifest itself? Where does it happen? And so on. All of that becomes under connectivity. Second thing is, why do you connect with people? It's because you want to have a relationship with them of whatever sort. Uh, relationships can be good. Relationships can be bad. Relationships change over time. They evolve. It's very hard to understand relationships. 
Um, we, by relationships, we want to go beyond the traditional notion of relations between states. International relations are formal things. You know, you're talking about Geneva Convention territory, you're talking about formal agreements, treaty obligations, and so on. We're interested in the whole set of relationships that exist across borders of nation states as they're currently constituted. Um, influence. Uh, states seek to influence the behavior of other actors in the world. Okay? They can be other states, but they can be other entities too. They can be corporations, they can be NGOs, they can be populations. They, uh, and how this influence is uh, brought about, what it means to influence somebody else, how do you know when you've influenced somebody, are all key questions today because there's a large, uh, a large field of research which suggests that the world we're living in, largely thanks to the ubiquity of social media and digital media, is a world in which perceptions matter more than anything, than they ever have in history before. Indeed, there was an article I was reading just the other day um, from a Pentagon general, a general in the Pentagon, who was saying that in the future of war will be a competition for perception and influence rather than a perception for land, resources or wealth. Whether that's right or not, I don't know, but it's interesting that a general in the Pentagon should say so. And then finally, the concept which I know is central to the work of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy of trust. What is a trusted relationship? Um, so, well, I'm not going to try and answer that question. I'm just going to leave it hanging there and we can maybe talk about that later. Now, these concepts apply to the whole range of transactions which cross borders. Um, so, we, states, uh, there's a spectrum of engagement but it, across a border which involves a state, it can go through other institutions, it can, it can take many, many forms, memberships of multilateral bodies, it can take trade agreements, it can be all sorts of things. Um, and we are interested in the whole spectrum of these relationships. Now, individuals are important uh, for a number of reasons. One is when you try and analyse this field, these networks, these relationships. Uh, we couldn't find a theoretical explanation, either from international relations theory, or from network theory, or from any other relevant area of communications theory, which adequately explained uh, the impacts or of the advent of digital media, where the costs are very, very low. The cost of publication to the world is lower than it's ever been. It's unique in human history. We've never lived in a situation like this before. So we're all in slightly uncharted territory. Um, so therefore, that's why we talk about transnational engagement. We're talking about something which crosses a border. We have to limit ourselves somehow. So we're not talking about multiculturalism within one country. What we're talking about is transnational effects. Now, uh, transnational engagement and relationships are becoming faster, cheaper, and more complex due to the radically reduced costs of communication and association, by which I mean people's ability to form groups with a common interest and a common purpose, stemming from internet technologies. Anybody can set up a blog site, anybody can tweet. The, co the marginal cost of that to the individual or the corporation is effectively zero. This is an unprecedented situation. So it's cheap. It's fast. These messages are transferred electronically. You know? I'm old enough to remember when email was introduced into government. And the degree of excitement, um, just a little anecdote, when I worked in the Cabinet Office in the 1980s, if you wanted to write a paper advising the minister, you had to write it longhand, hand it to a typist. The typist wasn't in the same building as you. The typist was in a different city. So your draft would be put into a brown envelope and sent off by the lady in the post room to, from London to Bournemouth, which is 200 miles away. The typist in Bournemouth would then type it, send it back in another brown envelope. The lady in the post room would send it to my office. I would look at it and say, oh no, there's a typing mistake in it. I can't possibly send this to the minister. What am I going to do? It was a little, made you think, frankly. A whole file on a complex policy subject could maybe be that thick. Because before you committed anything to writing, you had to think about it, because every word counted. You wanted to minimise the disruptions caused by the lady in Bournemouth, the typist, getting it wrong, and put, which sadly uh, happened, um, became very adept at the use of Tipex, which is another old technology nobody seems to know about anymore. But with the advent of email, uh, all of that has changed. Okay? And then with the advent of social media, um, things changed even more and even the syntax and grammar of communication has changed as a result.
Um, but this reduced cost, this increased speed, leads to the phenomenon of the copy addressee list. Okay? So you're not just communicating with one person. If I write something, and you know, like a birthday card, dear Alice, I hope you have a very happy birthday, that is directed to Alice. If I send an email, dear boss, you know, I hope you have a very happy birthday, CC, da -da 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 -da. 300 people work in the organization. Oh, the, the information expands exponentially, and goodness only knows what the effect of doing that is going to be, because it introduces a large amount of unpredictability, and then there's an information overload which can happen as a result of people responding to things who you weren't anticipating responding to things. It's very difficult, so it makes life more complex. And that's a very basic level of understanding it. But when you transfer these understandings into the workplace, or you transfer them into the world of diplomacy or public media, uh, it becomes immediately obvious that communications can become very messy, very difficult, liable to be misunderstood. Um, it's very, very hard to be clear and to be understood by people uh, using the new media. So there's a lot of um, confusion out there. And that challenges existing theoretical models for understanding international relations, which depend on an analysis of the privileged communications between State A and State B, or State A and the other members of some other treaty organisation that it happens to belong to. It's not like that anymore. These communications still exist, <coughs> But they're only one small part. They don't play the significant role they used to play in terms of determining the nature of the overall relationship. And that poses serious problems for governance, if you think about it. How do you run a Ministry of Foreign Affairs in a world where you don't really control the message? It's very difficult. It really is. And Ministries of Foreign Affairs everywhere are trying to get to grips with this. Um, so acceleration, reduced cost and complexity also introduces problematic relationships with other phenomena which are going on in the world today. So the first one, shifts in the patterns of global power. We can no longer assume that Western notions of what's normal are the ones which can be enforced by the West in a world which is multipolar, in a world where there are other actors who are just as significant, if not more so, than Western actors, and are increasingly competing for resources, attention, and uh, power in the world. And there are a wide range of culturally generated responses which everybody has to deal with in a multipolar world that we didn't have to deal with to quite the same extent anyway in a, in a less multipolar world. There is a more complex environment. There's a widening range of non-state actors that has to be taken into account. If you just imagine you're in an, an embassy in a country, do you really know who the non-state actors are in that country that you really need to be influencing. How do you know? Because you don't know where the next change is coming from. It could come from a very obscure incident which happens in a suburb, in a small town, not in the capital, in a vegetable market. I'm thinking here of Tunisia. Okay? The Jasmine Revolution really kicked off because of an incident which happened in a marketplace in a suburb of a small town way below the horizon of any foreign embassy in Tunisia. They couldn't have, they couldn't have anticipated that. So there's a widening range of non-state actors, including individuals and including loose associations with all sorts of motivations. The accelerating pace of events, innovation and change, this is a cliche, I don't need to say more about that. There, there's a lot about that already. And mounting opposition everywhere to trust in and governance by traditional institutions. This is certainly true if you look at research into levels of trust in governments across uh, the West and in other parts of the world too. It's very hard to assess uh, the future of governance, what that's going to have to look like in the 21st century if we think trust is a necessary component of effective governance. Now, we make an assumption that it is, and I'm sure we would all like to live in a world where we trusted institutions, but how do you trust... Uh, who are the institutions anyway that you need to trust? I mean, if you're living in Western Europe, do you trust the German government? Who trusts the German government? Can I put your hand up if you trust the German government? One person trusts the German... All right, who trusts the French government? Nobody. Oh, one? One? Okay, that's very good. I won't go on, but I think I've made my point. Who do you trust? Can somebody suggest an institution or a public body in whom you have trust? Would it be more likely to be an NGO? A single-issue NGO, Greenpeace, for instance, or... Uh, organizations that are involved in academic issues. It's very hard, isn't it? See? Start thinking. Who do you trust? Okay, it's very difficult. So, there's a problem. There is a real problem. 
And that's why this problem is urgent, and that's why the university is engaged in trying to understand these phenomena, explain them, and then help people who are involved in the practice uh, of transnational engagement, hopefully, to understand their situation and give them some tools for thinking about the future. Now, where do you start? Uh, if you're a researcher, you start with the data. Okay, where are the data in this field and the evidence? If you start with uh, an institution like the Centre for Cultural Relations, we're full of sociologists and political scientists. So we start with data about individuals, about individuals' preferences. Um, that's a traditional approach in sociology. You seek to understand societies, you seek to understand institutions, and so on and so forth. But you need evidence. There's a lack of it, frankly. There's a lot of assertion in the world at the moment, and a lot of belief statements which are in the public domain. So it's easy for me to say, I believe cultural diplomacy will help solve the international relations problems of the world, but how can I find the evidence to prove it? Okay? And there's always a risk when policymakers go to researchers and say, I believe this to be the case, what's the evidence? That really, when you start to look at the evidence, either it's not there or actually it's a bit inconvenient because the reality that you can actually describe doesn't quite conform to the expectation of the person who commissioned the research. And that can lead to all sorts of constructive discussions uh, between researchers and governments and other bodies. Now, there are a lot, many sources of evidence, but today I'm going to be talking about one of them, which is new tools and techniques which derive from the discipline of informatics, uh, which is, comprises a whole range of disciplines, computer science, artificial intelligence, and so on, which can give us some new understandings of at least part of what's going on in the world. Um, so what we want to do in the centre, I'll come on to the actual research in a minute, is to provide academic leadership on the changing nature of transnational engagement by developing new interdisciplinary collaborations. First point, one academic discipline is not enough. You can't possibly hope, if you're a, a specialist in international relations, to understand everything that's going on here. Um, so we need interdisciplinary collaboration, and that's a good thing in and of itself. We work with practitioners. Uh, we did a, a piece of initial research into what practitioners wanted from a Centre for Cultural Relations. They all said, we want theory, much to my surprise, but they also said the reason we want theory is because the practice of international cultural relations is about five years ahead of the theory that exists in international relations faculties of universities. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but it's what they said. So we want to develop theory, and we want to use that better theory, hopefully, to inform practice. We also want to draw on no, new tools, uh, big data analysis. More and more of the world is being digitised, and as it becomes digitised, it becomes capable of being analysed. Now, the quantities of data are absolutely enormous, and the power of data to affect um, things like um, uh, how you would manage an outbreak of a disease, for instance, just through observing people's behaviour on social media are astonishing. And if somebody from Google was standing here today, they would be able to tell you far more about that than I can. But big data analysis and also open data platforms, because one thing uh, we really do think is important is some kind of data commons, is the notion of putting information which is for the public good in the public domain. And there was a report written in the UK called the Shakespeare Report back in 2012, uh, about the use of public sector information uh, and the thrust of that is that governments should be encouraged and the EU is looking at this at the moment to put as much of their public service information into the public domain as they possibly can in order to help better decision making not by civil servants or by people working in governments but by ordinary people who can take that data or researchers and analyse it and often come up with very interesting conclusions of their own. So we want to deliver deeper theoretical understanding and we want to analyse and describe the practice by everyone involved in the field of cultural relations. So that brings me on to the main substance of the lecture, which is social media and political change. So what role do social media actually play in political empowerment and change? And why are we asking this question? Um, we're asking this question for reasons which are not very edifying, I don't think. We were approached by the British Council, and the British Council said, what can you tell us? about the UK's digital connectivity. How connected is the UK? We want league tables. We want to know, is the UK more connected than France, or Germany, or Holland, or America, or Brazil, or China, or South Africa, or wherever? Why do they want to know this? Uh, it's because they know perfectly well that it's really important to know how connected a country is uh, to other countries across borders in order to get some sort of 
understanding of how that country relates to the rest of the world around it. McKinsey's did some research um, last year, which demonstrated that in their view, Germany is actually the most connected country in the world. And I think this alarmed the British Council slightly, and I think they, so that's why they approached us and they said, you know, uh, what, what's the state of the UK's digital connectivity? And then what are the effects of this connectivity on political topics? In other words, so rather than looking at the UK and saying how digitally connected with the UK, what does the evidence that we have available tell us about whether any of this actually matters? I mean, does it really matter? You can ask a so what question here. Okay, the, the, you, know, you can construct a league table. France is more digitally connected than the UK. So what? Okay, what does that actually tell us? So how important are these media, these instruments of connectivity, for change, for understanding and explaining change in the world? And here we're talking about political empowerment and political change. We're not talking about other aspects of change. Um, now, governments increasingly use social media to support change in other states and to enhance soft power. So I'm going to talk about why governments do that just for a moment. And there's a quote here um, from Clay Shirky, the American writer, who wrote a book called Here Comes Everybody, which I commend to you. Uh, it's a very good read, apart from anything else. And it explains more about why social media actually matter and what can be done with social media, certainly than any other single volume I've read. Now, he's an enthusiast for social media, so you have to read critically, but it's still a very good introduction. And the, the, the explanation is so obvious, it's just not true. You all know it, and I'm sure everybody here uses social media. Is there anybody here who doesn't use social media? Anybody? No, I thought so. So everybody uses social media. Basically, the world's network population is in the billions now, something like half the population of the planet are connected uh, to social media at the moment. It's just a fact of life. Everybody uses it. Uh, governments use it, NGOs use it, people use it, and so on and so forth. So the challenge for government is, how does the ubiquity of social media affect the interests of states? So what should I do about this? I mean, I now know that half the population of the world is connected through social media, but so what? What does that matter? Now, let's just take one subsection of states, which is diplomats, which is a tiny proportion of the total, but a very important one. Um, if you talk to ministries of foreign affairs, they will say they all feel they need to be on Twitter. I'm sure you've all, I don't know if part of your studies have been looking at the Twitter accounts of various ambassadors and diplomats around the world who tweet probably more frequently than they are retweeted, almost certainly. Um, and we don't know whose tweets they look at. I mean, you can look to see who they're following, which is quite interesting, uh, and who follows them. It's also quite interesting. And you find, actually, that you find that there's a, in social media, there's a thing called the power law distribution. Interest in politics. A lot of people just aren't interested in politics. I mean, let's face it. So if you're not interested in politics, social media is not going to make you interested in politics. There's no evidence to suggest that. And trust in government, trust in institutions, trust in tweeters. I mean, how much do you trust Twitter or Google or Facebook? And it's quite interesting. So, but what it can do, it can increase engagement. It can attract people in, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee participation. So, technology does not necessarily equal empowerment. Because I have Twitter, it does not make me a more powerful person. It makes me a more connected person, but it doesn't necessarily make me a more powerful person. That power comes about through association. Social media are not necessarily used well. Well, there should be no surprise there, because it's a new technology. Um, not everybody knows how to use them. Um, I certainly wouldn't really know how to go about organising a political protest on Twitter. It would be quite an interesting exercise, I think, for you to think about how you would do that. Uh, or rationally, a lot of people on social media are just not rational. You know, they, they can act against their own interests, if you like. Um, so, for example, there was no role for Twitter in mobilising inside Iran. There was a lot of literature around the subject at the time, a lot of media coverage which suggested that Twitter was instrumental there. But actually it's not true. If you look at the evidence, the internet and TV uh, remain, traditional media remain information sources. And that's true even in countries where people know that the government is censoring the broadcasters or the mainstream media, interestingly. People know how to respond to media that they're familiar with, even if that media, uh, these media are censored. And then non-political topics. This brings me back to the cat. Um, I'm not going to read this out. There is a thing called the cute cat phenomenon, uh, which works both ways. Uh, a lot of people tweet about things or blog or whatever about things that are relevant to political change. Now, that works both ways. 
That means that governments can be quite reluctant to shut down social media platforms because they know it will annoy the vast majority of people on these platforms who just want to talk about personal things. On the other hand, it can make it very difficult for the key messages to stand out uh, in the noise. They get lost in the noise. Um, so, from that list uh, earlier on, there was no meaningful political change in Belarus, Iran or Thailand. And in many cases, there was no long-lasting impact. Uh, even when a, a protest is mobilised, social media is not enough to sustain it. That, sus that sustained engagement in the process of political change comes from politics. It comes from senses of grievance or dissatisfaction which have been in that society for a long time and where that grievance can be structured through existing ways of communication, existing forms of communication. In the Arab Spring, uh, television, particularly Al Jazeera, turns out to have been more important than social media. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. Bob Simons, who's the CBS correspondent, uh, who was particularly interested in the Arab Spring, he suggested uh, that a statue of Mark Zuckerberg should be erected in downtown Tunis to commemorate the role of Facebook in the Tunisian Revolution in 2011. Now, you will see graffiti from Tunisia, which will write, people will write Facebook on the wall. Uh, but the evidence is highly mixed as to whether the use of Facebook in particular actually had any impact whatsoever on the Tunisian Revolution, either in technological terms, because people were all too aware that the government there was quite adept, actually, at monitoring what was going on on Facebook, or because it's just not the most appropriate technology. But as the mythology has kind of grown up around some of these things, um, but the evidence shows, maybe slightly depressingly or optimistically, depending on your point of view, that political events precede social media. They come first. Social media follows. The use of social media in itself is just a medium, like television or letter writing or whatever. It doesn't generate events. It follows them largely. Now, states. What do states do? This is where... Um, it gets quite interesting. We did case studies of Tunisia, Iran and Egypt, particularly we were interested in the Arab Spring. So states can do all these things. They can block access to websites, they can close them, they can block content, they can control internet providers, they can shut down internet and mobile services. Uh, leaders can also persuade and frame discussions. They can put out their own messages which compete with the messages of dissenters. Um, why do they do this? Well, obviously because they want to stay in power. So regime survival. Uh, they can also perceive threats which may or may not exist, and these threats can be either cultural or maybe religious, uh, for example. They're interested in securitizing social media. If they think social media are liable to bring about change, then they may take steps to securitize social media uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and, they can, and in democracies too, you can, put, uh, you can see the current debate around, I just I don't know if you noticed, but Google, for instance, just restricted the kind of images which people can publish uh, on Google and followed a number of other sites in that way. So there are different types of restrictions operate in different contexts. So states can also learn. States are not stupid. Um, they may learn to allow enough social media to let people feel that they're expressing their grievances, to give them an illusion of freedom, uh, while they can maintain control of the political agenda without any direct pressure. Because people feel they can express themselves through social media, maybe that makes them less likely to protest and actually change things. Because to change things, you need to invest in real activity in real time. I'll go on to the costs. Uh, there's an economic argument about that in a moment. States also monitor social media because they want new ideas. Um, they want to find ways of enhancing their own legitimacy without losing control over the population. So they can propagate counter-propaganda and spread information and rumours. And this, is, this happens. It's happening at the moment in Ukraine, for instance, and Russia is doing this in a number of countries. Uh, and it's not just there, it's happening all over the world. Now, coming on to this notion of affordances, this is costs. Okay, there's an economic argument here. Social media, as I said at the beginning, are cheap. The marginal cost of tweeting is zero. Okay? But the offline world is material. So if you want to change things in the offline world, that costs. Costs time, costs effort, costs money a lot of the time. Resources need to be expended. So there's a discrepancy there between what's cheap in the social media world can often be very expensive in the real world. And the social media tools are not independent of the social context that they're used in. That's absolutely related to this point because if you're in a social context where it's easy to mobilise, there are very few restrictions 
on association. There are very few restrictions on, for instance, uh, expressing your views. It's cheaper in some ways for people to do that than it is in societies where there are penalties for doing these things. So tools are not independent of the social. Social networks can work both to empower people by making them better informed or by bringing them together in groups or to disempower them, as I've said, if, the, if these media are used in a negative way. Their use is embedded in dynamic historical and political context, something very important for students of cultural diplomacy. Every context you go into is dynamic, historically and politically. Things are changing all the time, and the pace of that change may be fast or slow, depending where you are, but there's always a context that's specific. Uh, and, you know, there's a thing about political learning. Um, social media can do that. They can help people learn politics by associating with people who've got a political stance. That they probably can do. They can also help with co-adaptation. They can help with people learning how to cope with the current situation. So states are quite good at putting out reassuring messages. Chinese government is very good. It doesn't censor content directly necessarily. It doesn't put its main effort into that. Rather what it does is it says things, but yes, that's true, but wouldn't it be better if we all thought like this? Okay. So people learn to, you know, learn to support the status quo and not to um, support change. So citizen-state interactions. We think social media, from the basis of our research, can lead to a long-term strengthening of civil society through increased association and through decreased communication costs. And that can expand the public sphere. But it's not sufficient. It may be necessary. It's not even necessary, I don't think, but it may be necessary. But it's not sufficient for empowerment or democratization. And there's mixed evidence, which brings on to another question, of how social use of social media influences existing beliefs. Does it change people's minds about things? Maybe, maybe in some places, maybe not everywhere. So, one thing, however, that social media does do um, for citizens is it connects them to people across borders. Hence our interest in this, because we are interested in cross-border effects, transnational engagement. They can connect to people in other countries. And they can do all sorts of things. Uh, they can communicate with people outside the country as an audience for their point of view. So they can send information. Look, help, I'm, you know, help, I'm, there's a riot here, the police are shooting protesters. Okay? They can discredit the regime by providing images of oppression or injustice or, or neglect or whatever. They can enhance their own legitimacy by, by developing and propagating narratives through social media. And they can advertise their ideas to a global audience that's not constrained by the borders of the country. Sorry, excuse me. Oppositions can also learn from social media about how people in other countries have done it. So if a revolution happens through social media in one place, people in other countries can learn how that worked. Of course, that works both ways. Governments can also learn how that revolution worked through social media. So that may or may not be an advantage. Um, this I will go over. This is quite interesting. Um, I'll, I'll just um, skip over it quite quickly. Uh, it's, it's actually not necessarily the case that the use of social media in a country is actually what it appears to be at first sight. During the Iranian Revolution, the Green Revolution, there appeared to be a massive Twitter traffic coming from inside Iran. On closer analysis, most of that, three quarters of it, was actually coming from California, from the Iranian diaspora population in California. So because it's not always easy to tell who's tweeting about what, it's easy to make mistakes about what's going on. And that's really quite important. And you can see that. I mean, Twitter activity about Syria mostly comes from the Gulf states. It doesn't come from Syria, from the US and from Egypt. Um, so coming back to cultural diplomacy, uh, what good are social media for cultural diplomacy? Well, uh, states can attempt to support change in other countries through the use of social media. And for example, Hillary Clinton uh, put a great deal of faith in this in the USA. Um, in particular, she thought she could do this by supporting the notion of internet freedom. Uh, now, you could say that's an appropriate policy for the United States because it's consistent with the values of the USA in terms of its strategic goals of strengthening civil society and because it resonates mostly with the First Amendment, right to freedom of expression. Okay, so what did Hillary do? She funded the development of tools designed to reopen access to the internet in countries that restrict it. Now, can you imagine the effect of that? If that works 
or it doesn't work. Actually, there was a problem with the technology which they used because actually its use exposed the users of it in that country to their own government as people who wanted to avoid the controls that government had put in place. By that government, frankly, I mean the Chinese government. The Chinese government was sophisticated enough to be able to do that. The technology the Americans deployed did not work very well. That was a problem. But who did she want to allow them access to? And she was quite clear about this. She didn't want them to censor outside websites. So Google, YouTube, or the New York Times. Uh, no. Who are Google, YouTube, and the New York Times? What are they? They're owned by American corporations. What she didn't do, what she did do, as I said, it addresses many of the questions we've identified. It helps to empower people. It's politically appealing. It's action oriented and it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it doesn't understand social media. It doesn't understand that people like to communicate privately amongst themselves, that far and away the majority of people on social media use it to communicate with their friends and close circle of acquaintances and families. Didn't, I forgot about that. It appears, to, it appears whether it does or not, to, to promote access to information and networks controlled by US corporations rather than helping local people. So it could be represented as being a policy that was in the self-interest of the USA rather than in the interest of the people in these countries who would have access to Google and YouTube and so on and so forth. Don't forget Google makes its money from advertising. So, uh, the, the, there's scope for cynicism there. Uh, it also overstated and overemphasized how important computers are. I mean, computers are important, but they're not as important necessarily as lo other low-cost alternatives which people use, which also count as media, like cell phones, for example. So, if you're a diplomat, what on earth should you do? If you're a practitioner of cultural diplomacy, you're in this increasingly complicated world where you can't really predict the outcome of what you do through social media. You're not terribly sure of its effects, if it's going to be plus or, or minus, if it's positive or negative. So there's some issues to think about. How do you understand local conditions of dissent? So if you're in an embassy, how do you understand the society that you're representing your country to? And how legitimate is it for you to support local dissent in any case? External support for dissent runs a risk, and this is well documented, of tainting even peaceful opposition as being directed by foreign governments. So the Hillary Clinton example is quite germane there. Dissidents can be exposed, as they were through the use of the haystack technology by the American government, uh, by the unintended effects of novel tools. So they developed these tools which they think are going to promote internet freedom. Actually, the tools were insufficiently tested. It was all done too quickly. And so that actually increased risks rather than decreased risks for the very people the Americans wanted to help. Now, a government's <coughs> demands for inter internet freedom abroad, or the American government's demands in this case, can vary from country to country depending on the importance of the relationship. How ready is America to annoy the EU in relation to this compared to China, for instance. These very same American corporations want to access the Chinese market. Okay? There are conflicting interests at stake here, and the networks of communication overlap to some extent with other networks. They overlap with political networks, cultural networks, media networks. They overlap with um, networks of finance and business. So, the transnational character of movements, you know, like the uh, Occupy movement, turns out to have been largely symbolic. In other words, they can communicate about what they do, but it doesn't necessarily translate into a mobilization of resources on the ground because of the, the cost differential. It's difficult to coordinate resources across borders. Groups are embedded in domestic social and political structures, which makes it hard for them to move. And if you look at the research on people's attitudes to globalization, it's only a very small percentage of the world's population, I think it's about 13%, who see themselves as part of any kind of global, globalized society. Far and away, the majority of people draw their identities locally from local circumstances, national circumstances, or regional circumstances. It's a far bigger proportion than see themselves as cosmopolitan citizens of the world. So that's not necessarily going to work. And for that reason, domestic issues are often prioritised over international ones. And you can certainly see this in the discussions that happen in most parliaments. Certainly in the UK, a country that is very globally connected, even there it's very hard to get members of parliament seriously interested in foreign affairs. Sad but true. So, 
topics. I'll come on to so protests can form around concepts and causes. So people like the Occupy movement are against neoliberal economics. Local protests can resonate through communications to wider transnational audiences. Um, Twitter, in particular, facilitates because of 140 characters. It's very condensed. Facilitates common languages and a consciousness of the temporal dimension is a very academic way of saying people know that things happen quickly. Twitter speeds things up or appears to speed things up. When things slow down, social media are less interesting because there's less to report. Okay? And there are complex links between transnational activist states and international institutions. So we did some research. Our informatics department at the university thought, well, how can we actually get a grip on what's going on? So we looked at what the evidence uh, was that was available um, about Twitter tools and techniques. We looked at Twitter um, for very practical reasons because Twitter are kind enough to make the Twitter data stream available to researchers. Uh, researching Facebook is much more difficult uh, because of the nature of Facebook. So we looked at Twitter. Um, so what we can look at is space. Where are things are happening in space? Now, these red blobs, there's a heat map, show where Twitter activity was greatest in relation to discussion of, can you, can you guess where? What is under discussion? Have you any, can you, can you guess from the distribution of the heat map, the blobs, what where might be under discussion? Sorry? Yes, absolutely. It's where Twitter is most used. Now, if you look, where are these countries? There's the USA, there's Western Europe, there's somewhere to the Eastern Europe, and there's somewhere in Southeast Asia. Is there an event which connects these places? Yes, absolutely. Who said that, sir? Yeah, yeah correct. In the, the crash of the airplane, the airplane in? Ukraine, this one coming from the Netherlands. Absolutely. Yes, that's right. This is the distribution of Twitter traffic in the world in response to the shooting down of MH17 over Ukraine okay, earlier last year. So we could see where people in the world are generating responses in social media to particular events. Okay. Now, sentiment is interesting. What view do people have? We can count the number of tweets, like we did on the previous map. That's just a simple number. So we can see where the activity is. But what are people saying? Are they expressing favorable opinions to an event, or a negative perception, or are they somewhere in the middle? That's sense sentiment analysis. And again, this uh, refers to Ukraine. And the number of tweets which we looked at, there was 18,000. I should say this is English language tweets only, which distorts the sample a little bit. Um, the map shows uh, the reaction in different parts of the world to the reporting of the shooting down of MH17. Slightly bizarre. Green is favorable. No, this isn't MH17. Sorry, this is before MH17. This is, this, this is the Ukraine protests. Um, you can see America is largely indifferent, to be honest. North America, Russia is expressing a degree of positive sentiment at the moment. About what, though? We're not quite sure, but it's expressing positive sentiment about uh, the Ukraine. So is China. So is the UK, slightly oddly, and some countries in South America and Africa. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. What are people actually tweeting? This is like the distribution of sentiment, but what are they tweeting about? What can we look at there? So by using the hashtag in Twitter, we know what the topic of the conversation is. Okay, we can count the topics that are hashtagged. It's not perfect, but it gives a good idea of what people are actually talking about. We know who people are talking about because we can pick up the names of entities. Okay, that's, that's relatively straightforward to do. So as you would expect in relation to Ukraine, um, Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin are two of the most uh, they're the two, far and away the two most uh, named entities in relation to the Ukraine crisis. The colours refer to people's perceptions of them. Uh, on this, you can't really see here terribly well, I don't think, but if something is red, it is negative. If something is blue, it is positive, and something purple is neither negative nor positive. So Obama and Putin at this point, and we're still looking back at March in the early days of the Ukraine crisis, are neither negative nor positive particularly, but they're certainly the most significant players. Finally, we can, talk, we can talk about where people are tweeting from with some degree of accuracy because we can geolocate tweets. And somewhat scarily, we can do this even where people haven't explicitly said where they're tweeting from. Now, I didn't say that, but it can be done from analysis of the Twitter stream. 
We don't do it to within a radius of 100 kilometres because we think it would be wrong in case the sample sizes are very small in, in contested places and we might get people into trouble. So we, we deliberately don't do that. But we can also see which places are being tweeted about. Okay. Now, this comes from another uh, cut of the Twitter data, looking at which cities in the UK people around the world are talking about. And um, can anybody guess which is the UK city people talk about most on Twitter? Mm. No. Come on, what's the most famous entity in the UK, probably, around the world? Manchester. Can anybody think why? Football. Correct, football. Comes back to the cute cats again. What do people actually tweet about in the UK, around the world? They tweet about Manchester United. Okay? And the most famous person in the UK is Louis van Gaal, good Dutchman, or van Gaal, is it? Um, good Dutchman. Uh, he's far more tweeted about than David Cameron, the Prime Minister, the Queen, or anybody else in the UK. Why? Because he's the manager of Manchester United. Uh, so, the reality, this is the cute cat syndrome again. People tweet about things that are of interest to them in their personal lives. They don't necessarily tweet about things that are of interest to diplomats or policymakers. But it, it's quite interesting. It's quite shocking. At Oxford, the Oxford statistics are quite interesting. We thought, we chose Oxford because we thought it's a famous university city. Let's see how many people are aware of Oxford University. Actually, almost nobody was tweeting about Oxford University. People were tweeting about Oxford United, which is the third division football team in the city of Oxford. So even a really bad football team is far more prominent in people's global consciousness than Oxford University, which, coming from Edinburgh University, filled us with a certain amount of pleasure. But, um, uh, <laughs> so that, that, was a good, that was a good result. And then influence. Well, this is the Ukraine in July. Influence is quite an interesting one. What we can do with Twitter... You, do you all use Twitter? No. Yeah. Who uses Twitter? Do I need to explain about Twitter? A little bit. I'll explain a little bit about Twitter. On Twitter, you can tweet, okay? Which is a message of 140 characters. And you can, when you tweet, it's just out there, and people can pick it up. Now, if people like your tweet, they can retweet it. So they just hit a little button on their cell phone, or whatever, and your message is then sent on to all the followers. Everybody has followers on Twitter. I, twi I tweet, I've got about 400 followers, okay? So if I tweet, 400 people get my tweets. Now, if I'm lucky, three people will retweet a tweet, that's very good. Uh, but if I'm Justin Bieber, probably 10 million people will retweet my tweets. So that means that my message doesn't just go to the 400 people who follow me on Twitter, it can also go to the people who follow the people who retweet my tweets, if you see where I'm going here. So if Justin Bieber retweeted my tweet, which is highly unlikely because he doesn't follow me, but if he did, he'd be a fool not to, I think, but, but, but that he doesn't, um, then uh, my tweet could reach millions of people. So the influence, you can build up a statistic of influence by the number of people who retweet tweets. But it's not just a simple linear relationship, okay? You get a high score on this thing called clout. You look up the website. I recommend you look at clout.com. Uh, it'll explain how it works better than I can. But um, what it does is it looks at the number of followers people who retweet you have. So if you're retweeted by someone who's got two followers, that doesn't really mean much, unless one of them is David Cameron, of course, in which case it can mean quite a lot. So that's weighted. Okay, there's a weighted score. So it's quite interesting. Now, clout by population is a way of assessing influence. So the countries down the left are the countries of origin of tweets. And these are the countries, these are the tweets that were most retweeted. So the country, slightly bizarrely, whose tweets were most influential in discussion of the crisis in Ukraine is the Maldive Islands. Why? Anybody suggest a reason? Followed by Malaysia. Now, Malaysia is easy to explain because it was a Malaysian Airlines aircraft. Singapore, possibly similarly. Brunei, possibly, I don't know, I'm not sure. Australia, maybe, I can understand the rest. Micronesia, though I'm slightly struggling why people in Micronesia would have such a passionate interest and be so influential in Twitter. Now, it's, in it's interesting, we don't quite know the answer to this. One, one suspicion we have is that it's to do with time zones and people taking false identities on Twitter. So it made a lot of people in the Arab world 
are concerned that their government sees what they tweet. So they assume a false identity on Twitter. But because of time zones, they, they describe themselves as being in a country that's in the same time zone. Why? Because you may not know who's tweeting, but you know when they tweeted. So the government will know when they tweeted. So if it looks as though someone from the Maldives is tweeting at a time when everyone in the Maldives should be fast asleep, people will get suspicious and they'll start to track back. And there are ways of tracking back that tweet. Okay? So what people in the Arab world have very cleverly do is they tweet purporting to be, claiming to be, from countries in the same time zone. So the Maldives are in a very similar time zone to a lot of countries in the Arab world. So that may explain why the Maldives Islands, and they're quite a popular false address for uh, dissenting voices in the Middle East. Um, anyway, so I'll just leave you with that idea. It's quite interesting, actually. We, can also, we also managed to measure people who export influence as opposed to people who import influence, because it works two ways. Okay? If I tweet about something, and that tweet is picked up by somebody in Germany, who then retweets it, I can claim I have influenced somebody in Germany. But if that person in Germany's tweet is then retweeted by three people in Britain, I can say that Germany is more influential than Britain is because the German tweet was retweeted more frequently than the British tweet. So we can come up with um, maps showing the flows of influence on Twitter. And in relation to this, it was very interesting, actually, over time. This is the last slide, you'll be glad to know. First slide is the one you saw already about sentiment about Ukraine. As you can see, there's a lot of favorable sentiment about Ukraine in March. By June, the focus of favorable sentiment to Ukraine has shifted to the USA and Canada and Australia. Why? Possibly because of the protests in Maidan and the way that um, Mark was showing me earlier on about uh, a YouTube video uh, by a lady, uh, I can't remember her name, but it's called I Am a Ukrainian, which is viewed, viewed by something like one and a half million people. So the message from Ukraine coming out at that point was possibly one of sort of resistance to Russia and resistance to oppression and so on, and that was picked up favorably in the West. And then in July, um, the favorable response to events in Ukraine just took a nosedive. And actually, the other thing you can see, sorry, it's an unfortunate expression, it just crashed through the floor. There were very, very few positive views of Ukraine by July. Now, why is that? Obviously, the shooting down of the aircraft uh, had a major effect. But what you can also see is the frequency of tweets coming from different places over time. I don't have a, a diagrams for all these things. But you can see, for instance, that the number of people tweeting about Ukraine was enormous in America. The sentiment may not have been favorable, but the number of people tweeting was enormous back in March. By June, almost nobody in America was tweeting. So these people who are favorable to the Ukraine are actually a very small number of probably politically engaged people. By July, the numbers went back up again because of the shooting down of the, air, the aircraft. And then, if we, we also looked at the Syrian crisis, and we found something similar, that the net, the UK, which was the British, this made the British Council very happy, was a net exporter of influence in relation to Syria compared to the UK, in the USA. So the UK could be said, through Twitter anyway, to be having more influence on the USA than the USA was having on the UK. Okay? And then, by the autumn and the debate on whether or not there should be intervention to oppose Assad's use of chemical weapons, and the British government, decide, British Parliament, decided not to intervene, not to support military intervention, support for Britain in the USA almost vanished, and Britain's influence on the USA vanished at that point. So influence comes and goes. Related, it's very related to events, and it's very related to perceptions. So what this means, you, what the evidence tells you, is that you can start, we're starting to develop tools to look at things like sentiment in social media, and to do this in real time. The next step for our research is going to be doing this in other languages, uh, other than English. We've already got some natural language processing tools, so we can work in a limited range of the major languages, so we can do this in Chinese and Arabic and Spanish and German and French and so on. Um, but we don't have, uh, sm uh, where there are smaller linguistic communities, it's less easy to develop the tools. So we, there's some work to do there. Uh, we also need to get this thing about sentiment better. At the moment, it's very crude. So are people positive about Ukraine or are they positive about 
particular events in Ukraine, if you actually analyse the individual tweets, you can see that a lot of the positive sentiment of Ukraine actually related to the performance of the Ukrainian basketball team. Okay? It was nothing to do with the crisis in eastern Ukraine. So we could, it's the cute cat problem again. This cute cat problem is probably the most difficult thing to deal with in social media analytics. It's filtering out the important from the unimportant. It's also being able to tell what's true from what's false. Okay? So I'm sorry to leave you on such an indeterminate note, but this, report, this is all going to be written up in a report which the British Council will publish later this year. Uh, and so you'll be able to see the finished work and what conclusions we think we can actually draw from all of this. All we're saying is that if you are studying cultural diplomacy, please don't assume that social media are necessarily going to change things fundamentally all that much. It's a slow process, it's a long process, and the main benefit they have is promoting civil engagement, as far as we can see amongst people. It helps to create a civic space. It doesn't necessarily impact on specific events. Okay, 